Welcome back to our History at Home series. Um, I counted, and this is the 40th um, internet program we've been doing since the early uh, April when we all shut down. Um, and I'm delighted tonight or today to do something a little bit different than we've been doing. Um, instead of it being a formal presentation, it's going to be an interview with Joseph Smith, and I'll get back to that in just a moment. I want to thank everybody, as always, for your kind words about these programs, for your enthusiasm about them. Um, and I would uh, like to say that if you have it in your heart to give us a donation, we always love that. Um, you can do it either by sending a check to us at 108 Orange Road uh, in Montclair, New Jersey, 07042. Um, you can do it by Venmo, just look up Montclair History Center, or you can do it on our website. You'll see a little link that says join or donate and you can do it that way as well. Um, really though, we love having you here. Even if you can't send us money, we so appreciate your being part of this series. It really helps connect us all during this very, very weird time that we have. Um, so I said it's gonna be a little bit different tonight because we're really just doing an interview. And the person we're interviewing has actually become a regular on all the rest of our programs. So you might've seen him before. Um, sometimes he's in dress. Sometimes he is just looking like a normal human being. Sometimes he looks like he stepped right out of the 17th century. Um, his name is Joseph Smith. And he had been a theatrical performer, uh, it, uh, working, doing such roles as John Merrick in The Elephant Man, playing Ty Cobb in Cobb. Um, and then Virgil and Dante's Inferno, so a real range of things that he's done. And he decided he was going to take his love of acting and combine it with his love of history. And he is now a performing artist of living history, as he calls himself. He portrays people and brings them from history and brings them forward in time in a way that is entertaining and engaging. He has performed at museums, historical societies, schools, cultural institutions, educational programs um, mm -hmm. with a wide variety of characters that he um, assumes. Um, and his passion, as he says on his website, is to create excitement and curiosity about history by giving voice to stories that celebrate the human spirit. And um, one of the people who watched one of his performances uh, when he was Augustine Fresnel said, Joseph Smith is a magical artist who gives his portrayals in such a unique manner that he makes the audience feel that they have gone back in time. So I'd like to welcome Joseph Smith to us tonight. And I'm gonna ask a few questions, but you are welcome to put your questions in the chat room or unmute yourself because this is a little more of a free-flowing program than we would normally have. So Joseph, welcome, thank you. Well, thank you, Jane. I really appreciate you having me here uh, today and uh, I look forward to sharing uh, all that uh, I can share with everyone. Great, so you, I know you're a Montclair resident and um, and uh, not too long ago did you move here. Can you tell us what drew you here to Montclair? Well, uh, my wife and I, we moved here to Montclair in January of 2018. And uh, my wife has a very dear close friend who went to college, they went to college together and she was singing the praises of Montclair, like, you know, her work where she works with the body, which would do well here, um, and that my work with, with history and and coming to New Jersey would do well. And so we actually had wanted to move a couple of years earlier than that, um, but uh, due to circumstances beyond our control, um, we waited until 2018. And in fact, we even went to one of the Montclair History Center's meetings uh, before we moved there, just to sort of get an idea of the history of Montclair. And, and uh, I, always, I always feel like it's important that wherever I move, in my experience, uh, to embrace that, the place that I'm going to live now, embrace that history, explore it, get curious about it. And so um, that's, that's what we did. And we, we have absolutely adored living here for the last almost at least three years in January. It's, it's gone by really quick. So you got into this after acting. Bef let's take it back before acting. You've said that you were not one of those kids that always knew you were going to be an actor when you were growing up. Can you tell us a little bit about the path that led you to acting? Yeah, I was very, um, very quiet in school. I never took 
part in any of the, the extracurricular, the, you know, I know in high school, they'll have the freshman sing, sophomore sing, so on and so forth. Um, but as a kid growing up as an only child, I would listen to music a lot. And I would uh, remember listening to the Beatles and Elvis Presley and Nat King Cole and just laying down next to those portable record players. Remember those? And um, put my ear up and memorize all the words of the song. And so I was, yeah, the reason why I'm actually in theater is because of music. And it's one word, karaoke. Now I know that, <laughs> that thankfully, yes, Nancy's giving me the thumbs up because she knows. Uh, thankfully, you're all sitting down. Um, never underestimate it. Karaoke led me to theater and also led me to meet, meeting my future wife, Donna. So never underestimate the power of getting in front of a room full of strangers and singing a, singing a song because you never know where it's going to lead you. That must have been one heck of a song. Uh, well, <laughs> fortunately, it was a song that I knew. Um, some coworkers of mine were at uh, a place in Manhattan and had karaoke on Friday nights. And they were playing a prank on someone that person had left without them knowing. And they came over to me. Why? I don't know. Maybe I was the, the, the victim <laughs> all along. And I went up and I sang All Shook Up by Elvis Presley. And so I thought, well, I, and I got such a, a great ovation from it. And so I thought, well, I did my good deed. Let me go. And the guy, Gary, who was running it, he said, no, 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 stay. Do the next song. And I gave him a look like, I hope I know. I know this next song, and it was Blue Suede Shoes, and I got an even bigger ovation. Yeah. Long story short, the following week, I had 16 people down from work to watch me and hear me sing. Yeah. So all of a sudden, I'm hooked, and I'm, on, I'm, I'm touring now as a karaoke. <laughs> I'm going to karaoke places every night of the week. It was really bad. Um, but that, I did that for a couple of years, and then someone who I knew from karaoke said to me, you know, we're doing the musical Funny Girl at our church. Would you, and we're still looking for Eddie Ryan. Would you be interested in, in doing the role? And so I thought, well, this is a wonderful opportunity, um, you know, get away from what I was going through in my home life. And I said, all right, I'll do it. Well, let me tell you something, Jane and everyone here on this Zoom call, I was like a fish in water. Mm. I had never been so comfortable than when, when I was on stage. In fact, the only time that I was nervous was off stage doing a costume change because I was concerned that I wasn't gonna get back on stage for the next scene that I was in. And, and was so, this a complete diversion from what you had been doing? What was, your, what was your career before this? Well, you know, Bruce Wayne doesn't say that he's Batman. Clark Kent doesn't say that he's Superman. All right, we'll move on, we'll, we'll move, move on. on. <laughs> Elaine is asking us, Elaine is asking us, um, where did you grow up? I was born in the Bronx, and then I moved to Staten Island when I was seven years old, and I lived on Staten Island for most of my, almost over 40 years, and then just the last almost three years I've been in Montclair. Um, but it's interesting, coming to Montclair, I'm actually coming home to my roots. By doing genealogy, I have found that my my grandparents and great-grandparents on my father's side were in West Hoboken. And so it's been mm -hmm. such a, a, a treat to kind of come back home. Welcome really. back to New Jersey. Well, thank you. It's good to be, good to be back in, in a certain way. Um, so tell us so, about your acting career then. Well then, yeah, so I, I do this play, Funny Girl, and then, you know, usually in a locality that has more than one theater company, people go and see each other's shows. And so someone saw me there and said, ooh, he's new, let's see if, you know. And so I just went from play to play to play saying yes, 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 because it was, I'm basically now learning on the job. I am learning, this is my learning curve. I'm learning from all these people who've had so many years of experience in theater. And, and literally there was one play that I did in Man For All Seasons where all the characters are on stage for the entire play and you get up from your seat to enter the scene. And I only had eight lines in the play, but I saw who was in the cast. And I realized, my goodness, I can just sit here and soak this all up and learn from watching. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. And so that led to Dante's Inferno. It led to meeting my wife, Donna. 
And so for 10 years from 95 to 2005, I'm doing theater left and right. But at the same time, I'm, I'm discovering, you know, renewing my love of history and specifically, specifically local history, Staten Island history. And it was then that sort of this switch went on and said, you know, I'm doing other people's shows, which I enjoyed doing, but I always was fascinated with the old cemetery uh, because the old brownstone and limestone, if you could read the limestone headstones, it always seemed to have a little story, a little epitaph. And I was always walking around wondering, does, do we know these people's stories? Um, you know, what were these people like? What were their what were their lives like? Who were they in their community when they were alive? What, what were the contributions that they made? And so it was kind of like tugging at my heart to, um, you know, say, hey, you know, if these be, if these folks have been forgotten because of the passage of time, and their stories are compelling and they can inspire and and, uh, and we can learn from it, yeah, let's let me let me do this. And so um, that's how that's how I put I put I put the two put the two together and and I've just been loving it ever since. Mm. I obviously share your same your affinity for cemeteries. I that's to me the stories of the people um, is really the the most fascinating part of it. So who is the first person you portrayed and why? Well, I got involved with uh, an organization called Friends of Abandoned Cemetery in Staten Island. It's a group that goes in and um, you know, they identify the cemeteries that have been abandoned, uh, they restore them, they rehabilitate them, they get the, the community involved. And so they had a private fundraiser and um, I, I got an opportunity to do two different people that are buried in that cemetery. And the first person I did was Edward Alfred Sargent. He was a, a, an architect who built a lot of uh, schools and, and homes throughout the New York City area. And I had the opportunity to hold in my hand an actual letter that he had written to his family. And that sort of kicked off the tour that was done at that particular private fundraiser um, for, for folks that would be interested in supporting this organization. And, uh, and then the other character was John Crabtree who owned the Silk Factory Company uh, on Staten Island. And, and just from that, I did another um, uh, performance at another cemetery that they were working on. And this gentleman was the third borough president of Staten Island, Calvin Decker Van Nain. And this was a, a borough president who during World War I, he opened up the doors of Borough Hall and he said, look, the public has access to this place. You know, if we've got to take care of people, the American Red Cross, whatever the case may be, our, our place is open and use our facility. And I did the performance as in correspondence with Fleet Week. And after the show, Donna was there to see this particular one. She comes up to me and she says, this is why you're here. This is your purpose. You got to do this. And, you know, that, that was the start of it. That was the start of it. Who else have you played? Uh, from there, I was able to, to portray a gentleman, another gentleman from Staten Island history, William T. Davis. This is a gentleman who was a self-trained naturalist and historian. He was a gentleman who uh, became renowned as a, a, a foremost uh, expert on cicadas. And people from around the country and around the world would seek this man out for his, his expert advice and, and knowledge on that, as well as other as other. Uh, uh, things in the natural world. And he's one of the co-founders of the Staten Island Museum, um, which is still in existence today. And this gentleman kept journals for 56 years. So I had the opportunity to go into the archives at, at Staten Island Museum and put on the white gloves and go through this journal. His journals are these huge, beautiful books. And I felt like I was having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with this man. And to, to, to see the, you could see the passion and the curiosity in his entries on a daily basis. And you knew what he was thinking and, and what he was observing. He was a great observer of nature. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that archives, 
you know, I've, I've gone to the Montclair History Center archives. I just, I love archives. It's uh, because you never know what you're going to find. Um, you know, you may be looking for one, one person and then all of a sudden you see that there's a cross reference. It's like, oh, this person knew that person. Oh, okay. Um, you know, and lead you uh, to a, another direction or another something that maybe you didn't know previously. And that's, that's the great thing about history. We're constantly finding out new things uh, as we go along. So, so, you know, yes, there's lost history, but there's also hidden history. There's history that has yet to be discovered or uncovered. And so that, that's exciting. And then, you know, that was the first, William T. Davis was the first portrayal that I got a grant for. And, uh, and so that, that was so, so fulfilling. And then Don and I, we actually did Speaking of Cemeteries, we were commissioned by the uh, Friends of Abandoned Cemeteries of Staten Island to do a full-length play at this cemetery, which was really three cemeteries combined. They were kind of like family homesteads, but then they combined them all. Um, and we threaded this story of seven individuals that were buried there. We did a, 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 the play and the tour on site. The person would be standing near where they were buried. And we found out through our research that some of these people knew each other very well. And we threaded this story and it was just a wonderful example. We had over a hundred people on the tour and just the constant thing was, wow, wow, I didn't know that. Or this really raised my awareness of my community in which I live and, and why these people were important and, and why it's important to, to remember them. That's one thing as, as human beings, we all want to be remembered. We don't want to be forgotten. And we want to know that, you know, while we had this time on this planet, we made a contribution, we meant something, we did, we did good. We left the place a little bit better than, than we found it. Do you think that's why you tend to um, portray people who are not as well known as some of the other people in the world? Yeah, I, I, I certainly think I, that I have an affinity towards that. Um, that it's, it's because while they were alive, they were known more much more than just the locality. They were nationally known or regionally known at the very least. Um, but because of that passage of time, maybe they passed away at an early age and, and were forgotten. Or it, it's just that, you know, time is the, that's the one constant is time. And, uh, so it, it just, and me being an only child, and so that, and, you know, um, and, and for most of my life, I was a single parent, it was kind of, I kind of had a sort of an empathy and a compassion and, and sort of a reverence to, to say, hey, you know, I'm going to take this on and, 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 and do that. So back to some of the people that you've done. I know you also did Frederick Law Olmsted at one point. Yes, that was an interesting, that was an interesting, I did that for the Greenbelt Conservancy. And that was a, a, a situation where the, uh, all five boroughs of New York City have their own parks commissioners and the parks commissioner for Staten Island was retiring. And his family, some of his family members had drafted this uh, thank you uh, that they wanted me to read, but they wanted, wanted me to read it as Frederick Law Olmsted, Olmsted. So I had decided to pull Frederick Law Olmsted out of the time, you know, the timeline just after the carriage accident. So I'm walking in with the cane and I'm limping a little bit. And, 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 and so I, I tell a little bit about my life, but then it, it shifted to me as Frederick Law Olmsted reading this lovely tribute to the Parks Commissioner uh, and on his retirement. And so it was really, it was a nice, it's those situations where, you know, you're, you're happy to do it because you're, you're celebrating someone's contributions who's, who's still alive and who's, who's made that impact. Um, and yet you're doing it from a place of someone who is, has a kinship because they were Central Park, Prospect right. Park, you know, and yes. uh, so it's, and, and, and of course, many parks throughout New Jersey and, and the rest of the country. And many in Montclair. And many in Montclair. Yeah, in fact, Essex County is celebrating its 125th anniversary, and uh, I had been in conversation with, with Essex County to possibly do something playing his son. Mm. Uh, uh, for the Cherry Blossom Festival, but, um, you know, they decided that they had this set, this set formula in place, and they thought, well, maybe it would work in some other capacity, uh, but then, of course, COVID hit, 
and right. so that's been everything shut down, right? Everything shut down, and but I've seen that you know, I've al I've always been the type of person who looks like the glass half full, not half empty, and I and I say you know what, we're just gonna we're just gonna extend that celebration another year. I know that Maine is celebrating its bicentennial of statehood. Yeah. They've had to postpone their events, but they're going to celebrate them in 2021. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just, it's, you do your best in this situation um, and you just do your best to stay the course. That's what so is it, you're going to love this segue. So speaking of glasses, tell us about Augustin Fresnel. Okay, well, uh, Augustin Jean Fresnel um, is uh, one of those persons from history that chose me. Sometimes I get to choose the person I want to portray, and sometimes they choose me. So I had done um, another person I've portrayed in the past is Philip Fresnel, poet of the American Revolution. And Staten Island Arts Organization was doing their first arts conference where everyone comes together and they brainstorm, like any conference. And I was asked to do a performance, and I, my choice of who I wanted to portray. And so I said, boy, this is the only chance I'm going to get to do Philip Fresnel on Staten Island. So I did, I did the show, and uh, then they had the lunch break. And I noticed this woman, she's making a beeline straight towards me. And, um, and so she says, are you planning to put in for a grant this year? I was like, um, I haven't given it much thought yet. She says, well, I'm from the National Lighthouse Museum. I'm on the board of, direct, on the board of trustees. You come see our executive director. We, you know, we, I'd, I'd like you to do something for us. And so I was like, okay. <laughs> so I went and had a meeting with Linda Dianto, who, unbeknownst to, to Mary Ann, well, the board of trustees member, uh, Linda and I had met a few years earlier at one of the conferences on New York State history up in Buffalo. And she had just taken on the role of, of getting this National Lighthouse Museum back up and running. And so I met with her and we're trying to figure out well, well, who could you do? Could you, maybe you could do George Putnam, you know, the president of the Lighthouse Board. Maybe you can do a lighthouse keeper. Um, so we're, we're banging our heads trying to figure out, you know, let's take a walk around the museum. So we're walking around the museum. We look at the, we're walking around the timeline, trying to get some ideas, walking or looking at some of the lighthouse keepers that are on the wall there. And then we go past a couple of the Fresnel lenses. And then there's Augustin Fresnel, the illustration of him, up on the board. And I'm looking at him. And Linda's looking at him. And I turn and I look at Linda. And Linda's looking at me. We turn back, we're looking at Augustin. Again, we look at Linda, Linda looks at me. One more time. And then we look back at each other. And Linda's, she says to me, you even look like him. And that's when I got the goose pimples. And when I get the goose pimples, or how Jennifer calls them, uh, Jennifer Lopez calls them goosies, um, I knew that was, that was like my message that yes, Augustine would very much love for you to tell his story. And so it was, it's probably been one of my most challenging portrayals because here's a man who's born and raised in France. The language. Now I'm part French and so thankfully there was a wonderful book written called A Short Bright Flash by Teresa Levitt. Beautiful book. But anybody who's into lighthouse and maritime history needs to have this in their library. And so that was one primary source but I also went and got the complete works of Augustin Fresnel online and it's, it's a challenge to, you know, you, you've got to translate these things. And, and I got a couple of other sources, Francois Arago, who was his mentor and champion. Francois Arago is another gentleman whose, his name is attached to every single science, French scientist from the 19th century, practically. Uh, but it showed the importance of not only believing in yourself, but having somebody else believe in you. And so we, it, it took quite a long time to develop this to, to you know, do the research. And I'm, I love research to the point where I'm researching so much that uh, Donna, my, who's not only my wife, but my director and editor says, okay, enough research, time to start writing. Come on, let's go. So, you know, you, you, I give myself enough 
time to research, a block of time to research, a block of time to write. And then of course you're gonna rewrite, edit, rewrite, edit, because it's it's like it's like composing a piece of music and 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 seeing where all the lines fit and there's a flow, and there's an arc. And I'm a, I'm a very big believer in strong entrances and exits. So I, I usually will come up with that first and then and then you know fill in the journey. As can you can you uh, pause for just a moment because I got a question from the chat room uh, asking, can you tell us what, um, why he is so important to the lighthouse? He's important to the lighthouse because he invented what is called the Fresnel lens. Um, before that time, lens technology consisted of lamps and mirrors. And so, or the, what they were known as reflectors. And reflection, Anytime you reflect light, you're actually losing 50% of that light through the reflection. The, uh, the rest of the light is being dispersed in other directions. Augustine come, came up with this idea of uh, lentilla echelon, building a lens by steps. He would make a lens that was like a prism. And so the, the construction of this lens would be surrounding that light source and magnifying that light by diffraction. And so that those beams would come in parallel lines in a concentrated one solid beam of light so that you could see this light from 20, 25 miles out from sea. And the importance of that is that it, it saved lives. It, it not only revolutionized lighthouse technology, but it saved lives. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Augustine only lived to be 39. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, his, his life of overcoming his, the, the health that he had, you know, he had tuberculosis. So he struggled with that all his life. And so to, to be able to overcome that and not give up and persevere and that, you know, scientists are all about curiosity and, and discovery and, and, you know, all right, if this doesn't work, well, maybe we'll try this. And, and that it's that constant need to improve because uh, if we're not learning, we're not growing. Gabor comments in the chat room, the big advantage he thinks is that the lens is very flat compared to the classical construction um, of the same optical power. Uh, that's also true. That's okay. also true. Yeah. So he spoke to you and said, tapped you on the shoulder and said, okay, tell my story. How else do you figure out who to tell? Is it, is it a combination of you just are enchanted with them or is it I can get some money out of this? Well, I th obviously, I think it's both. I think it's both, but I think you ha it has to resonate. It, it has to resonate for me. I have to really, uh, it's gotta be a compelling story. Can we learn from this gentleman, this person's life? Too? Can we learn from, um, from the ob obstacles that they overcame? Because then we can, we can recognize our own struggles and our own uh, challenges. And, and, you know, it's, um, and so, as I said, I, I sometimes will, will be able to choose that person. And if, you know, if there's an anniversary coming up, I, one of the things that I like to do is go to conferences and, and network at conferences. And, and that's how I got one of my living history performances out of that. A gentleman by the name of Charles Ross, who for a short period of time, made this artistic furniture during the same time as Gustav Stickley. In fact, when he's, ex he's exhibiting his furniture at the 1901 uh, exposition in Buffalo, he's right across the way from Gustav Stickley. So I would have loved to have seen the look on those two faces as they're looking at each other back and forth. But this man made this unique artistic furniture and he was also an actor. And he was an inventor and a creator. And so you know, there's a, I, I, yes, it has to, the person has to resonate for me uh, because when, when you do a performance and the audience sees how much you're enjoying it and you're living it, it's like, I, 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 I allow my body to be a vessel. And I, and I say to the person, what is it that you want me to tell this audience about your life in 30 to 45 minutes? And, and, and then I just, I just do it. So I interrupted you before when you were talking about the research that you do. How, how do you go about doing the research on someone? I know you've come to the History Center to look at our archives. You know, how else do you do it? 
it's 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 researching. I mean, thankfully, we live in an age where you know technology allows us to to research online. Um, but I also like to go to, to the sites themselves to walk in the footsteps of some of these folks. I when I portrayed Philip Brunel, I got a chance to go down to Princeton. Uh, he attended the College of New Jersey, which later became Princeton University. And can you and just tell us who he was? Philip Brunel was poet of the American Revolution. He um, he went to Princeton. He was roommates with James Madison. He uh, was he worked with uh, Thomas Jefferson as the editor of the National Gazette. Uh, he was a poet. He was a prisoner on a uh, on one of the ships, uh, uh, the British warships. Um, just a, a person who was very into Native American uh, and nature. I mean, first and foremost, he was a poet. But back then. He couldn't make, you know, the money wasn't there for poetry. So he had to go into journalism. And, and so he was, you know, he was, an, he was a radical activist. And, you know, so he had, he, he pushed, came to shove. He would push the envelope. Um, but it's, and, and it was another, another example of someone choosing me uh, and, and me not choosing him. So it just, you trust, you trust that, I always trust that when I get goose pimples or you know goosebumps and 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 the person resonates with me that this is this is the next the next project that I the next story that I need to share with you. Have you ever thought to yourself, yeah, this is the guy I want to do, and then you start doing research and you say, oh no, this is not telling a story I want to tell. <laughs> I, you know, it it's it has not quite happened yet. There is someone who is challenging for me, and I've portrayed him once, and I may, may be portraying him again, and that's Robert Moses. And this is a gentleman who, at one time, had 12 positions of power in New York City. We all know the, the power broker, the master builder, and we know, and, you know, learning about some of his viewpoints, it's been, mm, eh. you know, I, I got, that's another gentleman who I portrayed for the Greenbelt Conservancy, and but it was more we highlighted the fact that people stood up to him because he wanted to build a highway through the Greenbelt mm. and people stopped him. In fact, there's a mountain of rubble they had they'd started to pull away to put and they named it after him. And so when I went when I did a short preview ga at the at their gala, at the end of the performance, I said, Oh, by the way, I noticed you named the mountain after me. Nice touch. So, <laughs> So that got a laugh, and so uh, I may be doing him again. But in the in that particular context, what I want to do is come is not only portray Robert Moses, but also some of the people who stood up to him, who came together as a community, and stood up to him and said, "No, you can't, you can't do this. It's not, that's not, that's not what we want." So, and that that aligns with that the, the mission statement of celebrating the human spirit. Um, because you know, like, uh, Robert Moses did a lot of good, but he did a lot that wasn't so good. And so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's an interesting thing. You don't, there's, you don't want to sugarcoat anything right. and, and history is very exciting. You don't need to make anything up. And, and I, one thing I strive for is historical accuracy in what I do. So I always go for primary sources. When you talk about research, it's, it's um, journals, what their, their words, their actual words, mm -hmm. and uh, you know journals and 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 autobiographies. If they're you know, <laughs> and you take those sometimes with a grain of salt, uh, and, and particularly newspapers, newspapers you got to take with a grain of salt because they may have their own agenda, they may have their own bias, and and there's a lot of cross referencing. In, in the research that I do. I wanna know that it's not just in one place, it's in several, mm -hmm. so that I know for a fact, yeah, okay, we can go with this. So um, as a researcher, if you had one wish, what would it be? And I'll go first. My wish is that the 1890 census had not been burned in a fire. <laughs> I, am, I can definitely concur with you on that one, doing my own family genealogy. Anytime you mention 1890 to any genealogist, and I know there's a few on here. It's like you, you twist. It's like, you know. Um, one wish. Well, besides having a DeLorean that goes 88 miles per hour and going back in time to interview people, 
people that I portrayed, just in case I missed anything. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of things. One would be to actually have a photo of someone to know what they look like, because that's another thing, you know, you wanna, you wanna be able to dress in period clothing that's similar to what they did and the time period. Uh, but another thing is, what did they sound like? Because that's any, anything from the 19th century up until maybe the second decade of the 20th century, we really don't know what people sounded like. Unless you're doing, unless I'm doing a portrayal of, of someone from the silent era or, or, or radio or television or film early when there was sound, really don't have that to go on. But of course we do have the ability to, I have the ability to, to put a, a, an accent, a regional accent, or uh, you know, in the case of uh, Augustin Jean Fresnel, out of the darkness shines a brighter light. This is my legacy, my gift to humanity. My name is Augustin Jean Fresnel, inventor of the lens that bears my name, and which changes lighthouse technology forever, illuminating the seas, saving lives, and creating new light in new venues yet to come. So you can, you know, that's a French person, you get that French accent going. Of course, I, you know, I, I speak a little bit of French, but, um, and then you can also do, like with William T. Davis, that's local history, but you can, what I did with him was the fact that he was a scientist and self-trained and that he had this natural curiosity for the world, the natural world outside. And this is the great thing in terms of preparation, you get to put on these different accoutrements and, and, and it changes your whole persona. And getting, getting dressed in costume, and I know my, everyone who's done theater on this stage will agree that that's part of the process of becoming the, the person, whether it's a, 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 someone from history or a fictional character, you just embody this, this person. And so, as I said earlier, Mr. Davis wrote in his journals for 56 years, so I wanted to share something. And you can get this visual picture of him. And so what I did with his voice is just give it that curiosity, that wonder. August 25th, 1883. I tried to follow bumblebees to their nests today by tying string to their legs and then running after them. But as the experiments were made in the garden, the bees quickly got over the neighboring fences. I gave them sugar before tying on the string. Hmm. Perhaps I gave them too much sugar. So it's, it's, it's one of those things where um, you do your best, I do my best to, to strive for historical accuracy and, um, and just really become, just become a vessel and, and embody their essence uh, when I do a show. Do you write a script or do you, it, will you answer questions um, from an audience, for example, um, with that person's, in that person's um, words? Well, I have a, I have a script. I, I have a script and I, I, unless something happens during the show, and it has happened a couple of times where I've had to break the fourth wall, I will intervene as the character. Um, but uh, other than that, I will remain the character. And then what I do is after the performance, I have a Q&A. And I, and I enjoy the Q&As almost as much as I enjoy the performances um, because then I get, to, um, I get to learn, number one, because there's people in the audience, you know, I may be preaching to the choir and then someone will, will say something that maybe I didn't even think of. And I can say, well, that's something I could possibly add into the show for a future date, or, or maybe something didn't work, and I can and take that out. And, and so I, I always welcome uh, the Q&A. And then sometimes I find myself, I'm still speaking in, with a French accent, and, and then I'm, I'm still Augustin Fresnel. And, and so, uh, so the interaction with the audience is just, I, I, I love it, because they'll have questions both for the character, uh, and then also both for me as an actor, and, and, and what the process is, and what happens. It's both, both, both are enjoyable. 
so I'm going to move to the question and answer from the audience momentarily, but I want to ask you, um, have you, uh, Donna, you said your wife is an actress or is an actor as well. Have you ever performed with her other than in that one cemetery uh, program? And have you ever thought of doing the two of you together? Yes, we did. We did that one cemetery uh, event. Have we done anything else? Maybe. Many shows together, many theatrical shows. I mean, that's how we met. Cabarets, we've done cabarets that Don't Tell Mamas. We, we've done, uh, oh my goodness, it's just been an absolute joy. I mean, because one of the things on stage when you're, it's when you're a solo performer, and, and Mike will, will attest to this, you're on, you're, you're on your own, you're by yourself. So you, it's, it's just you that you rely on to, to get you through the performance, but if you've done your work, you know, it, it's, it's in you, it's in, it's in you and you can just, it's when you do the show for the first couple of times, that's when it gets a little bit, you know, cause you're, it's new. Um, but Don and I have done a lot of shows together. Living history, we did the, the cemetery one where we played a married couple. We are definitely looking at other opportunities. We, we went to a certain castle that is just on the outskirts of Montclair. We visited that castle and we're thinking, we're thinking that we may want to do that couple. Uh, and, I, and I'm sure that we're can, we can think of others uh, that we can do. So, and writing, and you know, Donna, she writes the script. Um, you know, she, she helps me with that script in terms of editing. And just, you know, because sometimes it's just a matter of moving a sentence or a paragraph and switching them around. Mm -hmm. And you've got this much better flow to the show. And I've had to do that on, on a number of occasions. And you just, you're always constantly trying to improve it and, and, and make it as, because we're all interested in that journey and, and showing it. I know when I first started, I was very much into the date. I was talking about the dates, you know, it's like, it's not so much the facts that people are gonna remember when you do a performance, it's how you made them feel at Absolutely. the end. Absolutely. Yeah. That's how you made them feel at the end. And so that's, that's what I strive for. So um, Elaine Fiveland, who is president of the Ran Randall Spaulding fan club, I believe, um, has suggested that you might want to look into him for Montclair history. And I've been wondering that you've been steeping yourself in Montclair history since you moved here. Are you drawn to any Montclair people? And um, if so, who and why? Yeah, there's a, there, there's a few. In fact, Elaine did a great job uh, with that article on Randall Spaulding. And uh, he's, he's on, I, I see him as one of the big three. Uh, Randall Spaulding, Amory Howe Bradford, and Dr. John Love. Mm. And, uh, but there are others. Um, I would be, I would, I know I got to mention Israel Crane because that's the first person. Don't have a lot of information about him. The, and that's, you know, and that's yeah. always been, that's always a challenge when you don't have the information available and that's when first you know of course I, I strive for historical accuracy but then this is where the the artistic license comes in but only to a certain point because it has to be it has to be in the realm of possibility for that time period we had a situation don and i when that cemetery play where we could not prove this gentleman alfred napoleon dufier who was a civil war general comes to America with an American woman, but they don't identif identify who that American woman is in the paper. But from what we could, with what we could decipher was her neighbor, Francis George Shaw, father of Robert Gould Shaw, could speak French. And we feel that because she was corresponding with Alfred and he could just, you know, translate those letters in French, we decided to say, you know what, that American woman is 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 Mary Pelton, and so we went with that. We couldn't prove it with without a shadow of a doubt that it was her, but you couldn't prove within a shadow of a doubt that it wasn't her. Right. So yeah, those that, those are the challenges, you know. Um, so Israel, it, it it would be a bit of a challenge. I um, but it's interesting that one of those anecdotal anec anec can you pronounce that word for me? Anecdotal. Thank you. Um, that's what I need. I need water. was one of the Meads. And supposedly she grew up, you know, her, 
most of her family knew the Cranes. They grew up with them. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested to see if there's any information with the Meads, and somewhere in there is maybe some piece of correspondence between the Cranes and the Meads. If you find it, let me know. I, oh, okay. That's all right. You've given me a purpose now, a mission. Oh, and the other thing I just want to toss out there is uh, if Donna wanted to do Stella Bradford, who's Amory Howe Bradford's daughter, that would be a cool one, too. Oh, okay. Just throwing wow. that out there. You, I'm going to open it up to everybody else if anybody would like to join in. Rita Heap has said when Joe and Donna do a show together, they take the stage and bring the story to life. They are amazing together. Um, and Carol Levin says, you kind of have to fall a bit in love with the character when you're going to perform them. So if anybody have any questions, you can either ask them in the chat room or just unmute yourself and ask away. I was going to say, uh, Jane, George Ennis is another person I'm looking for. George Ennis and Harry Fenn. Okay. From the Montclair Art Colony. Oh, and, you know, I, I got I to gotta confess. I have to, there's a, I have to make a confession. I have done a couple of mini performances of people from Montclair. Uh, one in person and a couple online. So uh, Samuel Wilde Jr., who was one of the founders of First Congregational Church, um, had a beautiful home on South Fullerton. Mm -hmm. And he was a gentleman who would give out what was called the Wild Prizes. Him and his wife would give out these prizes to students to uh, help them achieve academically. And his library was reported to be one of the, one of the best. So he's a collector of rare books. And, and him and his brother and his father had a store and in, uh, I think it was in Brooklyn or it might have been a month there, where they were one of the first to roast coffee for the wholesale grocery trade, which I, hey, coffee, I'm, I'm in. Wasn't he in the spice business? Spice as well. That's correct, Helen. Mm -hmm. I got to remember I'm preaching to the choir here, so I got to watch you. you know, if, I'm, <laughs> if I'm out of line with anything, you let me know. I've seen pictures of his house on South Bush, and I, I think it's where the library is now. Right. It's either the library. Now, I'm, I'm, I think that Dr. John Love, I think they were, weren't they neighbors? Samuel Wilde and Dr. Yeah. Love? Love was like on either they were right next to each other or kitty corner, like behind each other. I think Love might have been on Church Street. Okay. Um, I don't remember Love's now, office, but they were- Love's office was on Church Street. Yeah. Wild, where Wild's house was is either the, um, where the library is now or where the, um, you know, the, um, who's my guy? The Mills building is now, the uh, social services building or whatever you call that building. Um, Beth, is, say, Beth Shepherd is saying um, Wild was where the social services building is. Okay. That, I, that's Thanks, because, Beth. here's the thing, and, and Mike Francis will really appreciate this being, uh, portraying uh, Galileo. Samuel Wild also had, his own, he set up an observatory in his backyard, and he would have students come and look through the telescope. And if you go to the Avis Campbell Garden, you will notice that there's quite a bit of open air space out there. And when I'm, I'm standing there, I'm saying, oh my God, I think I'm in Samuel Wilde Jr.'s backyard. And because I see this, there's some beautiful old trees on the side, but where the garden is, and I'm looking up and I'm like, oh, I can totally see this telescope being, mm -hmm. totally see it here. I was like, oh, so, yeah. Uh, um Bradford and Love, by the way, are buried right next to each other or right near each other in, at Rosedale Cemetery. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. well, I've been able to do for First Congregational Church because they're celebrating its 150th anniversary. I've done a couple of Zoom where I just put Amory Bradford's name up on the, on the Zoom screen. I turned the video off. I put his name up there. And just like the old style radio. I share a little bit of his story with uh, with some of the members of FCC. It's really, it's been a, That's it's been fun. A yeah, and then uh, when um, we have the Christmas party at Nancy's, we I did Samuel Wilde Jr. and I portrayed him. And showed up in period costume, and you know Jane, when when at the end of the year when Montclair was celebrating its 150th, um, they had that great party at Pig and Prince, and thankfully we were, we get to we got to one more time in that place, where, right. which is an old Lackawanna train station. 
And I showed up in period. I got I got a chance to dance to modern music in period Victorian <laughs> costume. It was great. It was awesome. So, do you have a favorite character? Is that like asking you if you have a favorite kid? <laughs> um, I have favorites. I have favorites. Um, I guess I don't know if I have a favorite. I mean, it's it's because they all bring something to the table when it comes to their lives and their contributions. And, and so, I mean, William T. Davis is a favorite of mine because of his, of just getting to know this man and his, his natural curiosity and his journals. To, to, it, it's just, you, you feel like you're going back in time. It's really, you know, there are time machines. There are time machines. But the thing is, they've traveled forward in time. Anything that is in James' archives, that's a time machine. You know, when you go to Bowling Green Park in Lower Manhattan, that fence that's around that park, that's a time machine. Um, any building that is still standing, any house, it's a time machine. Um, and so I think, you know, to, to have that reverence, and of course you can't save everything, and I don't think you should save everything. There's change. It's a change is a natural part of life. But to, to really revere the contributions of, of people who live in your community. And it, it also deepens where you live. It's another reason why I do what I do. It, it deepens uh, where you live and you, you say, oh, that's, that's who that was. We, um, we have a, uh, um, an artifact in our dining room at the uh, Crane House and Historic YWCA that was a hand-drawn uh, family tree um, done by a Crane member, although not directly related to Israel. But I discovered that she was a physician back in the late 1800s, and lo and behold, the New Jersey Historical Society has her journal, basically, of all of the people she visited. And I went down there one day, and to your point before, when you said you really feel like you're getting to know and having a one-to-one -one conversation with them, I went down there and I just read through page after page of the baby she gave birth to or that she helped birth and it was just it was fascinating it really is when you can get that first person account from somebody it really is an amazing experience it, it absolutely is and 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 how we're all you know one of the favorite things I've done with Donna is that cemetery play because we got to thread stories throughout that and, and, and the relationships of some of these people together. Mm -hmm. And then the stories that you don't hear about. You know, we had an, an African-American woman nurse who took care of her to TB patients and her coworkers got together and purchased the headstone for her. And this is the early 1900s. And so, and, and of course, women in general, yeah. they you know, they didn't write, you know, you, you find in these history books, Oh, they write about the men, but what, what about the women? Yeah. Yeah. Don't Untold forget the ladies, as Abigail would tell John, you know, so. so and, that, and that's another thing I would like to do is to start writing living history for, you know, for women and, and have actresses portray these women, especially on a local level. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then of course, uh, women and people of color, you know, just, just really, because there are so many stories of people that we don't know and while they were alive, they made an impact big time in their community. So after the call today, you can reach out to Rita Singer, who said, would you and Donna consider uh, doing the Founders of the Muckler Art Museum? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we're talking, isn't that Rand? And wow. Yeah. Well, George Innes' Bicentennial is coming up in 2025, too. So that's another thing I have my eyes on. But yes, oh, that would be, that'd be spectacular. Yeah, I think, what was the gentleman's name? Was it Evans? Yes. William Evans. William, William Evans. Evans. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yes, we are interested. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? We have two minutes left. Anybody else have any other questions they want to ask or something they'd like to share with Joseph? I, I have a quick one, if you don't mind. Do you have a billion costumes in your in your closet? <laughs> well, yes. Now, now speaking of living history and, and going in the past, you know, they didn't have a lot of closets back then. Um, I have a closet that's just it's it's 
along with other things, it's packed to the gills with costumes because here, you know, you've got, you've got, I got Philip Fresnel. You know, you got the Derby. You got the skimmer, you know, it's, <laughs> you've got the, here, you got, you got this thing here, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, you've got to really know that you have, I have like three or four hat boxes just, and, and, you know, a hat box takes up a lot of space just in and of itself, but you want to, you want to be able to not only, um, you know, have authentic uh, costumes, but to take care of them as well. And, uh, you know, whether they're reproductions or the real deal. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Looking in the chat room to see if I missed anything. Uh, Nancy says uh, sh she has, well, Nancy, why don't you explain why, I ha why at the History Center we have the bag? My audio. Um, Stella Bradford was my grandmother's physician, my mother's physician, did my sister's pre-marriage exam, all of that stuff. And I remember her vaguely, but she knew that when I was in elementary school and junior high school, I had the dream of becoming a physician. And so when Stella, Aunt Stella, as we called her, when Aunt Stella died, she gave me her medical bag. And so, um, I kept it for years and years, and eventually, when I, I think when I moved back to Montclair, I guess, and got more involved with Jane and, and her ilk down on Orange Road, I decided that the, probably the best place for this was there. And I've done a little bit of research on Stella, but when you guys get ready to do that, I'll, you know, come and we'll have tea and we'll see what else I can dig up from my memory or whatever around here because she was a dear lady and a fantastic physician. And now you can have something in your hand that she had because the bag is still full of all the stuff. Well, most of the stuff. I kept a couple of things. <laughs> wow. Well, that's, that's, that's fantastic. So yeah. We will, we will definitely be there. We'll be picking your brain. Yeah. And that's well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joe, for joining us tonight or today. And um, we'll see you all in two weeks when I'll be doing a presentation on some of the people uh, from Bloomfield Avenue past and past. And maybe, maybe you need to step in and actually be those people instead. I'm in. Okay. Cool. <laughs> and maybe right, everybody take care.